just are now focused on microglia and aiming at understanding how these cells modulate neuronal activity. So the relevance of our research has been recognized through the attribution of funding from the European Research Counseling, uh, Council, um, amongst other funding schemes. And she herself has been the recipient of highly competitive fellowships, including HFSP, EMBO, and the Swiss National Science Foundation. She has also received several prestigious awards, including the Lise Prokof for Science and Technology Award and the Swiss Ops Award. Um, so today, the uh, the work that uh, Dr. Dr. Sandra will present to us is titled From a Bystander to an Influencer, How Microglia Adapt to Altered um, Environments and Influence Neuronal Activity. Uh, and so, without further ado, please, uh, Dr. Sander, the stage uh, is, is yours. You may start. Thank you very much, Sophia, for the nice introduction. And I'm very excited today um, explaining some of our research um, findings um, which we have been obtained in, in studying the immune cells in, in the brain and how they actually interact with, with the nervous system. So, um, the majority, of, um, so as Sylvia mentioned already, we are interested into the microglia. So microglia, they are often described as kind of like the parenchymal macrophages. They are overall distributed within the brain and uh, equally um, tile the brain. And um, they um, have a very um, uh, ramified structure. Uh, and what you can usually see when you, for example, look in the retina, you can very um, much appreciate that the microglia are sitting within the synaptic layers of, for example, like in here in the retina, the outer plexiform layer and the inner, inner plexiform layer. So overall, they are an, um, also very much um, um, highly surveillant. So they are not like just statically sitting there in, 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 the, in, in the nervous system, but actually the processes are constantly forming, reaching out and adapting into the local the environment. So this is a kind of in the healthy and adult brain. And what usually people have seen when they are looking at a microglia in, in, the, in, a, in an injury, like in, in our case, what we have been done, for example, an optic nerve crush injury, you will see that the microglia morphology is changing in, in their shape. They become much more um, um, compact, more like an amoeboid kind of shape. And what they are doing in this situation is that they are start to phagocytosis, for example, in this case, apoptotic ganglion cells, as you can here beautifully see um, um, in, in, this, in the retina, where we have here the retina ganglion cells labeled with RPPMF staining. So if you think about uh, this, um, this idea, so the classical view over 100 years of about microglia function was mostly to categorize microglia in two types, ever in two surveillance microglia, like I've shown you before in the video, though they're screening the environment, and into this very reactive microphages, um, in, in a, which you typically see in a disease or in a, in a developmental time point. And there, um, there was the common belief that um, factors like neuronal injury, invading pathogens, inflammatory signals, shifting those microglia towards a reactive state, stimulate the, uh, this microglia, acting as a macrophage, and taking up the uh, the um, potential insults uh, to the nervous system. So therefore, a typical classification has been like. Um, to, to describe this microglia as a pro-inflammatory phenotype and where the microglia would uh, take, uh, uh, take up the pathogens and regulate the tissue damage and induce a neuroinflammatory signature. Whereas in, um, in then this kind of response is then resolved with an anti-inflammatory phenotype where the inflammatory uh, transition is, is um, solved. So this was kind of the perspective when I started my group in 2015. 
And um, I was like um, wondering how, um, um, and we were interested how this kind of like reaction, how microglial switching from one or the other state is actually happening. And we, uh, uh, and how much actually this action is in the, is actually black and white, because we can imagine that it, this is like a kind of an extreme state. How um, if, uh, how does the microglia know how to respond correctly, and how does it distinguish in uh, certain factors like the inflammatory signals to do a targeted response to remove circuit elements? And uh, when I started my group, I thought the retina provides a very a nice example because they're in the, in the in this retinal structure we have a very clear defined circuit, and we would exactly know which um, um, components of the circuitry um, will be targetedly removed by the microglia in this context. Um, I will today in, in today's talk. I actually um, will not uh, so much talk about the retina because uh, we have also explored in other aspects and in, in, in this. And actually, the retina guided us to some interesting findings, which I would like to introduce you today, um, also in 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 other brain tissues. So just to uh, emphasize the the common structure of like how the um, microglia are switching for uh, in in this stage. Because what we know is like that often the microglia of from, of acting from um, surveillance to the reactive phenotype has actually an intermediate state. And we have been now recently shown that this intermediate state can have severe impact already. And just not only like synapse modeling, remodeling, but also remodeling, for example, extracellular matrix molecules or leading to network adaptations. So this is kind of like giving like a perspective of like um, the overall idea of the microglia. And throughout my talk, I will focus on two topics um, I, I'm showing you. The first one is asking the question, how informative is the shape of a microglia? And second, also, I would like to, uh, to show you how ketamine uh, in, in combination with the microglia reinstates juvenile plasticity. So let's start with the first part of my of this uh, of my talk about the information of shape. So we know as biologists that shape is very informative. We know, for example, like how the beak of, of a bird can be informative in whether it um, um, has as a food target insects or it um, uh, or eating seeds. So because the be in the Beak, a beak of the uh, of the bird dictates um, the access to this food resource. Other examples we also know is like, for example, the protein structure or um, 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 receptor modification. So we know that um, the certain shape of a protein also influences how it's functional. So. Shapes are linked to functionality. And similar, we know this also in the nervous system. When we are looking at neurons, we know that, um, the uh, that we have a huge variability of um, neurons in, in the uh, morphological different neurons in, in the nervous system, and that environmental changes influences this morphology. So this said, um, shapes are relevant in the nervous system and are they also likely for, uh, so in, in this way we would propose they're also likely relevant for microglia. Especially if you think about what kind of multiple tasks microglia have um, been described in the last couple of years. So we know that microglia, besides removing pathogens, also is heavily involved in like um, in various um, disease um, aspects in removing, uh, for example, neuronal debris, protein aggregates in like amyloid block in Alzheimer's disease. They are also heavily interaction interacting with blood vessel inter uh, cells and of course the synapse removal. And so far. Um, um, people have tried to classify those kind of uh, microglia into a different kind of categories. You, If you look in the microglia field, you will find a lot of terminologies, especially like um, M0, M1, M2, um, categorize, uh, trying to categorize a microglia 
functional state with a morphology. However, the taxonomy often is like very confusing. It is like associated ever they compare morphology or a certain feature, functional features, gene transcriptions. So overall, it's kind of a mess, I would say. So I am very, uh, and it's not uh, like very consistent. So we were wondering how could we have solved this kind of question? How do we get from a shape to a function? That was our initial motivation to do so. However, we realized um, we have to go a step back and actually ask how to determine the shape actually of a microglia. And that is actually, I think, uh, it seems to be a very initially very trivial task. But when you dig in, you realize that this is actually not as straightforward to answer. So. What has been done so far is we, in the traditional, if you look at the traditional way how microglia morphology is compared, we have usually a healthy microglia and we have a deceased microglia. This is like a, two extreme examples. We generate a 3D skeleton of those ones. And then we say, say we analyze, for example, the terminal endpoints. This is a typical um, marker people are doing. So we start to count the endpoints of the terminals and we say the healthy has 16 terminal endpoints, the disease has, for example, in this case, nine. So um, since the disease has less terminal endpoints, it's the microglia is more reactive. This is, um, is an, uh, a, we can do this in very extreme situation. It might be also informative. However, what will you do, do in, in a case where you actually have, for example, just like 14 terminal endpoints or 12 terminal endpoints? Um, is the microglia now more reactive or is it less reactive? What does it mean? Or how do we can get actually nail it down? Because Mother, what it's doing is, is the microglia is not necessarily um, switching from a healthy to the disease state with a click. No, it's actually a gradually uh, adaptation of the microglia. So some of the changes can actually already indicate if the microglia is re re reactive and um, could potentially respond in altering the, the, the system. So our goal was now to, um, in this um, first part, to reduce the tree complexity, what we have um, of this microglia, this three-dimensional space, and retain as many information as possible. And at the same time, you limit the user-defined bias because like, um, I can choose any parameter which I want from terminal endpoints to length of um, branches. There's over like Imaris even comes up with like 60 to 80 different features which I can select. And I can uh, just to get a way of like this um, selecting features that fit my, my expectations, we thought we want to have another strategy to overcome this. And and so in this way, we developed morphomics, we call it, in collaboration with uh, EPFL and KTH and just to give you a little um, perspective on, um, on what morphomics actually means and um, what it contains. Um, morphomics is consisting of three parts. So the first one is a topological morphological descriptor. So what we are doing is we take a traced microglia and then reconstruct this rooted uh, microglia three and um, using topological uh, algebraic topology to simplify these tree structures in three dimensional space. So basically reducing the tree uh, to, uh, to um, Without um, reducing too, uh, without taking away the complexity. So what we are doing is we take the rooted tree and then we um, generate a persistent barcode, which is like we applying a filter function, which is distance from the soma, and then we gradually go through and um, trace the individual uh, um, bar uh, lengths of the um, rooted um, tree. So, and how does it work? I mean, this was now a very uh, quick view, but if you are like looking for a more um, um, step by step, just to get that you get an incentive, what is, is happening? So if we start here, when the first time the radius is hitting um, a terminal endpoint, so in, in this case, um, we would label it in blue, we would say there is a process born. 
Then the radius goes further and there is an, uh, it hits in a certain distance another uh, process. And this is like, in this case, we labeled it orange, which is another process is born. And then it reaches a bifurcation point. And at this bifurcation point, we make a decision. We say the blue process was born first, so the or and then the orange process dies off. And this way, we can simplify um, the tree in, 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 in a way that it results into a barcode that we can then reconvert into a persistence diagram and then further into a persistence image, which gives us in, um, which simplifies these very complex tree structures into an, 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 a picture which indicates where are the location of the different branches within our um, in our uh, image. So we uh, this is, was the first step. But uh, I to remind you, we uh, we have seen that the microglia are very reactive, and this was now a video of thirty minute uh, thirty minutes recording. So you see that the processes are highly um, moving, and that causes, of course, a lot of variability when we are tracing microglia. So we had to find another strategy how to overcome this, like. Um, and this, um, this variability induced. And therefore, in part two of Mark Farmix, we're using a statistical approach to dissect the, uh, the, uh, the morphological features. So we generate from each microglia um, a persistence image, which forms a microglia pool. Then we take each of these uh, persistence images and bootstrap the um, and selecting out like um, probably uh, around like 20 images and then generate an average from this. So we can do this. And in this way, we reduce the dispersion of, um, the, uh, of the variability and um, make it more concise and, and get in and, um, and yeah, and, and represent our images as a bootstrap persistence images. And finally, to represent the data, we're using tools from uh, machine learning to visualize the data in, into the, the multi-dimensional data into an, a UMAP space. And we decided UMAP because it's a very intuitive um, um, strategy to be represented because we have been commonly exposed to this with single cell RNA sequencing. So we are familiar with this kind of representations. So this was more like now the theory, but let's actually look at the data, how it actually looks like. So we started to um, um, use morphomics in, in a way in which we are looking, for, um, we decided to look for um, microglia morphologies from seven day in different brain regions, from, um, you know, from the olfactory bulb, frontal cortex, somatosensory cortex, dentigyre, substantia nigra, cochlear nucleus, and cerebellum. And we generate, um, we collected from adult brain um, um, a certain amount of um, uh, microglia in three-dimensional space. And just to uh, emphasize again that um, and uh, how, um, so if we then would look at the terminal endpoints, what we would see is like the microglia morphology is distinct to cerebellum and cochlear nucleus. Yes, we can propose it, but probably, uh, but it, the terminal endpoint could not distinguish the morphologies between uh, the other five brain regions. Even so, there seems to be like variability going on, but um, it was not a uh, determinant endpoints doesn't seem to be the accurate parameter to do so. Now, when we use the same cells and then using um, a morphomics, we actually are able now to segregate the different um, microglia morphologies from the individual brain regions. So what you see here is, as before, we see the cerebellum and the cochlear nucleus separated apart. But interestingly, we also see that the somatosensory cortex um, is distinct as well as well microglia from the dentigyrus, the substantia nigra, and interestingly, the microglia from the frontal cortex and the olfactory bulb seem to be intermingled. So, um, so just to emphasize how um, morphomics is now able to actually um, uh, resolve the spatial heterogeneity. And, and we also were like wondering, is 
morphomics um, truly better than like what is commonly used in for analyzing microglia morphology. So if you're um, in, in the community, you would be very much aware of that um, shawl analysis has been kind of the gold standard so far to analyze the microglia morphologies. Um, where you form concentric uh, circles uh, around from the soma and then count the number of intersections um, the, uh, in distance from the radius. So we can do this with this data and also similar as you have been seeing before, the cochlear, nucleus and cerebellum are separating from the upper brain region. However, you could not see any further segregation here. And you also run into a, a huge bias here because um, if I ask you which radi a radius to choose from, you, it is very, um, it, it, there seems to be like variability within the group. So some would choose three microns or one micron. There is no clear standard for this. So if we, uh, if we now would, for example, like say, okay, I introduced you morphomics as these three parts. So instead of like using TMN, a TMD, we could just use the shawl analysis and use the same statistical approach in machine learning just to, to, to see if that would potentially, if the statistical approach of the machine learning would um, represent the data different if you input shawl analysis result. You will see, you will see that there is actually no possibility with the shawl analysis to separate it the individual uh, microglia morphologies across the brain region, as we would have, uh, as we have seen here with the TMD. So, for, uh, so strengthening furthermore how uh, how beautiful it is to uh, use this uh, morphomics approach to separate microglia morphology. So this said. Um, we started then to build a reference atlas. And um, so we have like for the adult, we have like um, this um, almost like 10,000 microglia already. So and then we started to look further into different disease models and specifically Alzheimer's disease because uh, microglia have been known to be very reactive and during Alzheimer's disease progression, one of the Alzheimer models, the familiar form of AD, and uh, we choose three and six months, which has been shown to, um, to induce amyloid block deposition and starts to induce neuronal cell death. And if we trace the microglia morphology from the somatosensory cortex, so this is in the control adult animals, you can see that the microglia morphology is shifting from th uh, three to six months in the somatosensory cortex just to emphasize the, um, the, uh, the differences occurring with this degeneration model. Also, when we use another degeneration model um, in Alzheimer's disease, the CKP25, this is a fast uh, neurodegenerative dis um, um, progressive degeneration. We choose like th um, three, three time points, one, two, and six weeks. So the one week is like a very early onset, and then two and um, weeks we started to see first phenotypes, and six weeks you see already neuronal um, loss. You can appreciate that even the, uh, this different disease model starts already to, um, to have a distinct morphology compared even to the 5X FID. So in the one week, it seems to be kind of overlapping with the six month 5X FID model. Whereas like the, um, the fast um, degeneration, you see that the microglia are already like in a different morphological state. So this is kind of, uh, it gives you a, 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 a taste of how we could start to look further into the data. We also included then um, developmental time points, so specifically postnatal uh, time points at P7, P15, P22. And we also included uh, sex specific differences. So we have like a data set of male and female. So um, leading us to a total of like 40,000 microglia traced that are available. And that allows us actually now to generate brain region reference maps, which I, which we think that is absolutely critical as a reference to um, to identify how the microglia is adapting. 
Um, we started, um, just to give you some example, a reference map, a map is for here in this case, for example, in the frontal cortex we have built. So we have here our control microglia um, cluster, and you can see in, 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 in females in the frontal cortex, and then we have P7, P15, and P22 as developmental time points. Um, where you see that the P22 is already much more closer to the control uh, condition. And that the P15, apparently some um, synapse remodeling is going on that triggers a microglia in the nervous kind of state. Then we included these two Alzheimer models, the um, less um, severe, um, slower disease model, which you um, see in, in this kind of range uh, in between um, distinct to the control, but not as severe as we would see with, for example, the fast degeneration model, where you see um, initially at one week, it's still kind of as control, but then at two weeks, it start microglia start to evolve. And then after six weeks, reach a kind of an, a disease arm where it's like localizing. So you have kind of a trajectory going on in this context. Now, when we look in the male, we can see a similar kind of, um, of phenotype. We have to control. However, interestingly, you see also that the P15 microglia here in males seems to be kind of different to what you have seen at the P15 of the females, which is kind of an interesting insight that might be indicating that some important features going on in the frontal cortex um, in, in, in the um, degeneration that could, could should be further explored. Interestingly, it becomes like when we, for example, look in the Alzheimer model, where you can appreciate that the, in the male, you see that initially the, uh, in the male, and the microglia are not as fast responding as in females. So you can see they are actually like um, first uh, one week and then two weeks and then only suddenly jump over into the six weeks approach. So it um, so there are like also indicate like sex specific differences, and now of course you can say yeah you show me the frontal cortex how does it look in uh, in brain region where for example the degeneration phenotypes have not such a strong impact. So for example the cerebellum is one of the model where we would not expect to see massive changes in the um, degeneration. Um, both of the degeneration model, and indeed, they're kind of the microglia clustering um, for the uh, for the different de de degeneration models in in this kind of niche, and the, only the developmental time points are kind of um, reaching out into the de into the different areas, with the exception of P twenty two, which is overall already on the control cluster. Similar also in the male, um, uh, male environment, where you see also that um, the, the disease are mostly within the cluster niche. So this said, um, we have now this over 40,000 uh, microglia um, reference atlas available. Uh, we have the morphomics algorithm to reduce the complexity and importantly, um, we have no user selection bias. So we don't um, induce any variation or in any parameters to tune what we would like to see. So this is like what the algorithm give out, like, gives out. And we have now generated um, reference maps for all the seven brain regions. And I will show you in the next, uh, in, for the next um, part, how we can actually now use this information. So how to determine from going from the step to how to determine the shape to how to get uh, from shape to function. Which nicely transition me now to our second part of, of my presentation, which is focusing on the microglia, ketamine, and reinstatement of juvenile plasticity. So we know um, ketamine is often used in, in animal research. Um, we have been commonly using it as a drug to induce anesthesia or as an alternative to isoforin. Um, it uh, has been very commonly used. 
And recent, in the recent couple of years, ketamine became more and more attention because as a treatment for treating, uh, for treating depression. It has to be a an, an truck of interest becoming. Now, um, what we have been um, um, interested in is like um, on the aspect that ketamine is uh, inducing anesthesia, which is kind of a temporary downregulation of neuronal activity. And we know that microclear responding to neuronal activity. So we were wondering whether ketamine could be potentially have an impact on the microclear reactivity. And that was kind of our motivation to look at it. And um, there's also the um, assumption that even if you give repeated anesthesia, that it should not actually affect the overall uh, well-being of the animal. So so to start this, we we looked and we designed a paradigm in which we used adult animals and we um, performed three times ketamine anesthesia with uh, three days in between. And we analyzed the microglia morphology four hours after the induction of the ketamine anesthesia. And this is like a, an overview of the morphology. And I think you can get a taste of like, um, if I would ask you, um, are they look different? It might be not immediately um, obvious how they could be different in, in a way. You may say oh, they have maybe less branches here. However, you cannot be 100% sure. And if you would do shawl analysis, what we have been be done, you will have a huge error rate, and it will be, uh, and it's almost impossible to distinguish. So, in this way, we can now take advantage of our morphomics and, and using our reference map to a, to actually reveal whether microclear are different between the one, two, and three times ketamine. We have now here the somatosensory cortex reference map. And here you see the uh, adult surveillance cluster of the microglia. And here we have the rea reactive cluster. So that contains all the conditions of the development, um, the 5XFID, and the, both Alzheimer's model. Now, if we are looking how ketamine and microglia morphology track along this map. So you would see that first, um, when we give one-time ketamine, they are kind of like localizing within the control cluster. So this is four hours after the ketamine. So it seems like there is not an immediate effect occurring on. However, when we do like two times ketamine and also looked after four hours, we see that the microclear cluster um, changed the morphology and going more, more towards the reactive cluster, which after three times KXA is even more reaching this cluster, suggesting to us there is like an adaptive response of the microclear morphology and the more and more you expose it to the um, to the, um, the, the, to the ketamine. And interestingly, um, we, it was for us when we, after three times ketamine, and uh, looked at the recovery of the microglia morphology. The general assumption is that with general anesthesia, even there, and the, the animal should go back to the, to the status quo, how it was before the anesthesia. So if we are started to look after the three times ketamine and looked at three days after the recovery, how the microglia morphology looks like, it goes towards the, um, the control cluster. However, interestingly, if you look one week after, you start to see a deviation from the control cluster. And after two weeks, you see that the microglia are in a kind of in a different state a different um, area within our map, which is distinct from the control um, condition and from the reactive cluster, which could indicate a potentially um, primed state of the microglia morphology. So I, I, this uh, I just emphasizes how, uh, one, uh, how, how informative this morphomics uh, it can be to guide also like um, the, to, to, to investigate what is actually changing in the microglia and what they are actually doing. And that's what we started to do initially with the, um, with the one, two and three times ketamine anesthesia because what we have been seeing um, 
um, besides the morphological changes, we saw also an upregulation of the endosomal lysosomal marker CD68, which we found like increasing over, over the exposure time window. And usually that means that it's somehow going a more in phagocytic reactive state. However, when we started to look into the um, into the upregulator uh, in, in what it could potentially phagocytos, we didn't see any apoptotic cells or um, astrocleosis or um, anything that would indicate that um, stimulates the microglia reactivity. So that makes us th uh, thinking what could it be that the microglia uh, initiate or how they could removing or what could it uh, actually um, be the factor um, that might be triggering a microglia response. In this way, we started to think back on what is ketamine doing. So we know that ketamine acts on NMD re receptors, which are sitting on um, cortical, uh, amongst other also specifically on cortical inhibitory neurons, like the pavalbumin neurons in, 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 the, in the cortex. And, and what you can see is also that these pavalbumin neurons are commonly um, coded by an extracellular matrix structure, which is called the perineural net. And um, the perineural, uh, which we can uh, label with uh, WFA. So it's very nicely surrounding this pavalbumin neurons. And the idea of this perineural net is that the um, it kind of protects the neuron from synaptic changes. It uh, prevents that can that new synapses can be formed, it, or that um, also molecules can be exchanged, and also it limits the um, uh, um, the um, tracking of the receptors within this in the space. So kind of key locks the the neuron in a certain state. You find this perineural net location um, throughout uh, the cortical areas. Um, here uh, you see also from the frontal cortex to the motor cortex to the somatosensory and visual cortex, so overall expressed. And so, and it uh, and yeah. So we were interested in what could be now, could it be that the microglia removing this kind of perineal and that's open up our ketamine stimulation. So we started to do this experiment in which we um, looked at the somatosensory cortex and this is in the saline condition. And then after one times ketamine, we didn't see an obvious phenotype. And remember the morphomics um, parameter also didn't, didn't indicate some, um, massive changes because the microglia was mostly with the um, um, control condition. And interestingly, when we competed it two times, three times, or even six times, we saw uh, started to see a loss of the um, PNN coding within the uh, somatosensory cortex. So, which we quantified. So you see that we, within like a six times exposure, we see a loss of like almost like 80% of the PN encoded cells in this. And, and we also found that the microclear um, CD68 contained PNA fragments. And as you see here, you have here the WFA uh, coding um, within the CD68, within the microclear. So, and this was the highest when we performed it after three times ketamine. And just to emphasize that this is not just like a single beautiful example we have been seeing. We, if we looked overall in the field of view, we found that multiple locations that um, microclear uh, um, CD68 contained WFA. And also we um, performed um, ex vivo imaging just to identify how the microglia are potentially interacting with the um, with the PNN code structure. So you here you see the saline condition, the microglia, how they're kind of touching the, the, the PNN code structure, but actually don't um, um, 
have heavily interact with this. In contrast to the two times ketamine anesthesia, where you see that the microglia are heavily interacting, you see processes within the PNN coated structure here occurring, and you see an accumulation of the PNN inside the microglia, which we also quantified in our in study that over a time of only like 20 minutes, we saw a massive in, uh, increase of the WFA content within the microglia. Now, are microglia really involved in the dismantling of the PNN? So um, to answer this question, we depleted the microglia and um, using a protocol in which we use um, PLX5622. This is um, a drug which is a CSF1 receptor inhibitor, which leads to microglia depletion um, within like one and a half, a half weeks of exposure to this food. And when we applied to this food and then gave three times ketamine anesthesia, we did not see any more this massive loss of the PF, of the perineural net in the tissue. So suggesting to us that the microglia are a critical a, a component in removing this, um, this um, structure. Now, I'm talking a lot about the PNN, um, but which consequences does PNN removal have potentially? And what could be, an, and could, which kind of effect it could have into, um, into the neural function? And um, for this, I have to go a, sh a, sh a short uh, step back in, in reminding you, if we focus on the PNN has a kind of an important function in, in associated to the um, visual, for example, visual processing. So if you think about um, the visual cortex, it has to learn at one point um, during the development how uh, if an image comes from the left or from the right eye, and it has to learn um, how it can combine those images together. However, the brain does not constantly have to learn this information um, because that would be um, um, loss of resources that could be used for other sites. Therefore, um, there is a critical period um, a window where the brain is sensitive to the input of the left and the right eye and uh, learns um, the different to distinguish this input and then um, to to fix this kind of information there uh, is uh, is uh, has been shown that the pnn maturation is um, involved in this process which is kind of locking the brain into this defined state now, if we would now, um, well, what we are now proposing is that in the adult, when we are like removing this um, ketamine, this might ha actually open up a window of plasticity to unlock adult plasticity potentially and to reset the, 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 the input from the left to the right arm. So to address this, we, um, we can look at the ocular dominance plasticity, which um, which it defines if you if the input is stronger from uh, from the, from the contour or from the ipsilateral eye, and what you can do normally is um, you can uh, monocular deprive um, one of the eye, and then in juvenile animals you would see a shift from the contra to the ipsilateral eye uh, after um, um, monocular deprivation of more than th uh, three um, three. Uh, of around three to four days. In adulthood, you would need like a much longer time point and you like, like at least uh, 10 days if you want to see such, such kind of a shift. So we thought that ketamine could potentially enhance this process and could cause this kind of shift to occur. So first of all, we confirmed that also we see in the visual cortex the PNN loss. And then we started to, uh, uh, to introduce the experiment in which we do ocular dominance um, plasticity recording in collaboration with uh, the lab of Mark Baer, um, where we have, uh, where we, our paradigm is, um, where we um, in, implanted the electrode and then we looked, um, gave three times ketamine or saline and um, applied a three days mono ocular deprivation. 
When we started with saline treatment, we didn't find any difference. So we see that the contour and ipsilateral eye um, is no different before, even before monocular deprivation, after monocular deprivation, there was no difference. Overall, also the contour ipsilateral ratio doesn't show any effect. When we started to look at ketamine treatment, so three times after ketamine treatment, we also didn't see a shift of the contra and ipsilateral eye. However, three days after monoocular deprivation, we started to observe a shift in the contra ipsilateral ratios with an increase of the ipsilateral um, contralateral signature um, to, co to come an uh, equal point. And this was maintained from uh, one day up to seven days. So we still see this like um, um, a change in, in, in the adaptation, suggesting to us we open up a potential plasticity um, um, pro approach and we uh, transiently reinstate a kind of juvenile like plasticity. To further confirm that this is actually um, indeed uh, something that the microglia are performing this in a targeted way, we um, also looked at the interaction of pavalvomy neurons with the microglia because the uh, PNN formation around pavalvomy neurons, um, we would expect to see the microglia somehow closer to the pavalvomy neurons. And indeed, this is the case. You see here in the saline condition, the microglia are rather distant to pavalvomy neurons overall in, in this network view. But um, when we give the three times ketamine, you see that the distance of the microglia also comes much closer to the pavalvomy neurons. And I, why I'm emphasizing the pavalvomy neurons also is because pavalvomy interneurons are associated with um, a maturation of a gamma brain oscillatory frequency activity. And this was something that um, kind of inspired us in, in, uh, in, to further explore because there was a recent study um, um, from Li Wei Sai's lab who has been shown that microglia respond to 40 hertz brain oscillation and stimulated the microglia to remove amyloid plaque structures by just shining 40 hertz light frequency. Um, inspired by this, we started to perform local field potential recording under ketamine anesthesia and uh, identified how does actually ketamine alter the, the activity. And what we can see is that indeed we see an, 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 a massive upregulation of 60 hertz um, uh, frequency early on when we induce ketamine anesthesia. So in this way, we were inspired to look how could it be that 60 hertz oscillation might be already beneficial enough to remove the perineural net? So in this way, we have then, um, um, oops, sorry. So um, we have um, performed a paradigm in, we, in, we, in which we gave the animals a 60 hertz like figuring for over a course of five days for two hours. And as a control, we also used eight hertz and 40 hertz and to see um, if there is any differences occurring. And when we started to analyze the density of PNM coded cells, we found um, that only with 60 Hertz light flickering, a significant reduction in the amount of PNM coded cells in the visual cortex. Similarly, we also observe that um, the 60 Hertz stimulation triggered the microglia morphology to come closer to the pavalvomy neurons compared to the constant light exposure. And we also found that the 60 Hertz oscillation recapitulates ketamine induced effects. Meaning that we also saw like that the, um, the microglia took up um, WFA in CD168, uh, so eating up the structures and contain and only, and that was the most remarkable point, uh, is that only with 60 hertz frequency, we saw the selective uptake of PNN inside uh, the microglia CD68. So, um, we can say that we're now with our approach, what we have been um, doing is that um, microglia dismantle PNN um, with ketamine, as well as with the 60 hertz light entrainment and uh, provides an opportunity to reinstate juvenile light 
plasticity. And, and this is particular in, in, in comparison with also our morphomics approach, is this even more striking because it and the morphomics approach guided us towards like this um, um, ketamine mediated effect. So now in um, this is kind of like um, what I wanted to present to you today about um, the, the different aspects we are looking in, in two projects we have been looking in the lab. And our future outlook is now to look more into um, how our sex dependent is a microglia response. And this is something we are now further exploring how much is like uh, male female differences um, occurring. So it seems like from the morphomics data, we have indication there is a strong sex difference bias. Um, we also started to see a sex uh, specific difference in the retina. So we're coming back to um, what um, our lab is, uh, my lab is also um, mostly focusing on in the retina tissue. And we just um, currently writing up a manuscript in which we are identified that metabolism of microglia is different regulated between males and females in microglia in the, in the retina. So stay tuned. I hope that we submit this um, rather sooner in, the, in this paper. So if you're interested and, and stay tuned. So in summary, um, I have introduced you how informative is the shape of the microglia. I introduced you the, the tool about morphomics, how it helps us to identify um, the differences in the, in the microglia morphology. That was done in collaboration with EPFL and the lab of um, has, uh, Catherine Hess and also Vida Canari and um, also in KTH Stockholm and um, with Wojtek Tchaikovsky and, uh, and uh, others. And um, Lee Wesai gave us some, uh, gave us the Alzheimer mouse models, which we have been used for tracing the, um, the microglia. And the second part I've been showing you how we use this morphomics and it, it guided us to um, identify the effects of ketamine and how it leads us to reinstatement of juvenile-like plasticity, which was uh, uh, also, uh, where we had a collaborator, Mark Baer, who, held, uh, who performed with us the um, ocular dominance plasticity recording. So finally, um, I would like to thank my group um, um, also um, from the team. Um, so if you are looking for the morphomics paper, um, Gloria and uh, Colombo and Ryan Cubero are the key uh, authors of this um, manuscript. And uh, the ketamine approach was done um, by Alessandro, uh, um, project. But we also have other, um, a lot of other um, um, things currently going on, specifically in the retina. So if you're interested you, uh, about the met metabolomics coming out, but we also have uh, generated chimeric G protein coupled receptors that mimic signaling, signaling pathways and modulate microglia response. So this might be something to, 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 to check out. It's on, on bioarchive. The same way also we have human iPS um, derived um, microglia and retinal organoids in which we started to look in what are um, what they are they doing and how they actually um, influence um, normal function. So with this, um, I would like to thank you for um, um, taking the time to join this talk and I'm open for any questions. Thank you so much, Sandra. Uh, it was uh, fantastic. It was a really comprehensive talk on the, the, this tool and then and on microglia morphology and function. It's really uh, beautiful. Um, so we don't have much time for questions. We also had a bit of a delay, but um, uh, anyway, so I, I, I would like to quickly ask you um, uh, first, was there really a reason or a rationale where for um, which you would expect to see different morphologies in the different parts of the brain? Do you have a link between um, maybe function and 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 uh, microglia morphology, uh, or was it already known that or, or kind of uh, people had this idea that you had? different morphologies in the different uh, parts of the brain. 
because me as a league, I, I would not expect to see any. <laughs> no, um, we would expect um, this kind of difference to occur because each brain each processes information differently. So, and knowing that microglia are very sensitive to the local environment, um, we would expect to see like local responses. Um, for example, it has been shown in, uh, in various diseases that microglia in certain brain regions started to respond in others not at all. So um, it is kind of surprising, I have to agree, in, during ad adulthood that we see this difference. They are, not, they are, they are there. Um, they become much more prominent um, when we are triggering a disease or doing the development. We also saw like initially the microglia are kind of similar, but then you see a segregation of the of this um, to occur. So overall the origin of the microglia is the same, but then it adapts to the local environment. And this is kind of reflected also then in the, in the morphology. Mm -hmm. Very good. Uh, so uh, we have two questions in the ch in the chat. I will try to uh, we will try to be brief, but I, I would like to ask ask ask, ask them both. So uh, Rita Cardoso uh, says really interesting talk. Thank you. I was wondering if the changes in glia morphology with the ketamine treatment correlate with changes in animal behavior and if so which so we haven't you. looked at the animal behavior itself so that's straight to say um the paper what i've cited from Holborn, there have been an, using an extensive research uh, um, analysis to um, to see behavior difference but they didn't see any massive changes. There were some slight anxiety kind of behavior with six times ketamine, but overall um, the, um, the behavior was not dominant, which probably makes sense because what we also have seen with the, um, with the um, ocular dominance plasticity, if you just induce ketamine, um, it doesn't cause a changes in me, uh, initially. Only then if you combine it with monoocular deprivation, so changing the environmental input, then you see have uh, see a readjustment of the brain, and then you would see these changes. So I, my suspicion is, um, as long as you keep the animal in a happy environment and don't disturb it, you will not probably see a strong behavior phenotype. But if you would, for example, after ketamine anesthesia, stress the animal, it might uh, cause a severe effect. That's so what I have. Open to plasticity. Yes. Um, so, and at last, so is there a genetic manipulation where, I'm, I'm sorry, this is from Zita Santos. So, uh, is there a genetic manipulation where one could manipulate or lock the morphology of microglia in specific states? I would imagine cytoskeleton regulators, for instance, uh, to address the functional relevance of specific states in the different functions of the glia. Thank you. Is it clear? I mean, this is really um, a very uh, interesting question, and that's something we would be love to target. Um, I think, first of all, it was important for us to have like a reliable uh, strategy available to track morphology. And now we are in the, in the, in the fortunate position to ask, how is the transcriptional landscape or protein landscape changing in this environment? Can we actually um, add a certain, um, like, like mentioned, cytoskeleton um, state approaches to uh, or, uh, regulators to a certain state? And I think this is the next step, which probably takes another 10 years to analyze all of these kind of factors and um, nail down certain um, functional um, aspects to the morphology. But this is like, yeah, very intriguing. And I think this is, yeah. Absolutely. We are all very excited with this. <laughs> so, um... So uh, that's it. We don't really have much uh, more time. But again, thank you, Dr. Sandy. It was really uh, interesting and, and, and engaging. Um, so thanks, everyone, for joining us today. Uh, we will have uh, one uh, week break. Um, 
and we will be back back on the 17th with Scott uh, Kanoski uh, talking about Western diet consumption and memory impairment, what, when, and how. Maybe microglia has something to do with it. Uh, see you all next week, and thank you so much uh, for your presentation. Uh,